Hi, I'm Evangelist Bruce Mejia from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Amani, California. The film you're about to watch is a documentary exposing the heresy of dispensationalism. Faithful Word Baptist Church has teamed up with Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California to expose this heresy, but also to educate Christians regarding this dangerous doctrine that has permeated many churches. Feel free to share this video with family and friends. Subscribe to the channel for future films. God bless and hope you enjoy. We need to reject, fight against, and demolish dispensation. What is dispensationalism? Amen. The part of the chapter we're going to focus on is found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, where the Bible reads, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Just at kind of the base level, what is dispensationalism? Where did dispensational theology come from? This view that we're calling dispensational pre-tribulational premillennialism um, has been the dominant perspective in American evangelicalism for about the last 115 to 20 years. And you will not find the idea that we are going to escape the Antichrist until approximately 140 years ago when a 15 year old girl had a revelation. And that revelation was picked up by J.N. Darby, the founder of the Plymouth Brethren, and developed into a form of theology known as dispensational theology. That Mr. Darby took, uh, took his gospel of the rapture to the United States. And he came in contact with the Billy Graham of his day. His name was Dwight L. Moody, founder of the Moody Bible Institute and Moody Press and all of that. Moody became the sort of worldwide dis disseminator of this theology of dispensationalism and a pre-tribulation rapture on both sides of the Atlantic and for a very long time. And then we were off and running. Dispensationalism is, a, is, a, is essentially a method of interpretation of understanding the Bible 
which translates the Bible literally in its historic and uh, poetic and wisdom literature, all of it, and reads it at, at face value, interpretively, mm-hmm. and understands Israel to be take priority in God's program and, and then gets to the church and the church is, is separate. Now let me say this. Dispensationalism is a man-made structure for understanding the Bible. It needs to be understood right off the bat. It's man-made. God worked with people in different times. There were dispensations of periods of times in which God worked with a certain people in a certain way. God has given certain programs through uh, biblical history and the history of man and that he is operating in certain ways in revealing his sovereign way and rule. And until you see that, you can never truly understand the Bible. You're studying a timeline. You're saying this truth fits here, thus this truth, these events fit there. I've seen other people say there's nine or there's eleven dispensations. You can make as many different dispensations as you want. But principally that there were seven uh, economies of time before the fall, after the fall, et cetera, et cetera. And Schofield in his notes even hinted that there were different ways of salvation from Old Testament and New Testament. You get to the dispensation of grace in the church, yep. for instance. Well, that would assume in that case that grace didn't exist prior. So now God has turned his attention to the Gentiles and we in the church are part of this air, uh, this dispensation of grace, but God still has to keep those promises that he made to Israel. Dispensationalism, by the way, is simply a title for theology that recognizes a literal nation Israel to be restored in the future. God gave them that land. They own that land. I am compelled to be a dispensationalist. And uh, the reason for that is because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, but all scripture does not apply to the same people at the same time. And this is the key to understanding the New Testament. You remember I told you that there's a key, like the keystone I mentioned over the window. You get the key, and the key will help you because everything relates to that key in one fashion or another, and it's what opens up the New Testament. And I told you what the key was to the New Testament is the Jew. Hi, my name is Roger Jimenez. I'm the pastor of Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. Our church is non-dispensational, and I am excited uh, to be able to be part of a documentary that is going to expose the heresies of dispensationalism. I'm Evangelist Bruce Mejia from Faith Forward Baptist Church in Amani, California. Our church is a non-dispensational, independent fundamental Baptist church. Dispensationalism is an interpretive system that was created in the 1830s by a man by the name of John Nelson Darby. And the objective of this so-called theological structure is to partition the Bible along with its teachings on salvation into seven different time periods or what they would refer to as dispensations. And it basically allows them to cut up the Bible so that they can put certain scriptures into certain dispensations that either do or don't apply to us today. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And they claim that 2 Timothy 2.15 is an instruction to basically isolate the Bible into seven different time periods and modify salvation based upon those dispensations. This time period here, I'm going to dispense my grace this way. This time period here, I'm going to dispense it this way. Now we're going to see that God has dispensed different methods of salvation. You see, the instruction there is not to partition the Bible into seven different time periods, but rather to compare Scripture with Scripture. This is the Bible's interpretive system to guarantee us biblical knowledge and safeguard us from seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They believe dispensationalism means that that basically God uh, 
took time and, and separated in different segments on how people got saved. Dispensationalism's method of interpreting the Bible does not stem from God. Because the Bible tells us that God is a God of order, He is not the author of confusion. Whereas dispensationalists have this ambiguous approach to the Bible where the interpretation is subject to the teacher teaching it and how many dispensations they believe in. And they'll say only sections of the Bible apply to us today and other sections apply to other dispensations. You see, the Bible is divided. Old Testament, New Testament. There's the end. You may think like, well, what's the big deal if people think that God worked with man at different times and different ages? And here's what you need to understand. Dispensationalism is literally the backbone that props up most of the heresy that is taught today by fundamentalist Christians, by conservative Christians. For example, throughout the scriptures, we see that salvation has always been the same. David was saved by faith. Abraham was saved by faith. Romans 3.28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. But what does dispensationalism do? It seeks to change that. So when you ask the question, is dispensationalism that big of a deal? The answer is yes. This doctrine needs to be exposed because of the fact it promotes so many false doctrines. You see, those who adhere to this doctrine have completely redefined the term dispensation. Dispensation simply means a manner of rule and economy. In fact, it comes from the, uh, uh, the Greek word oikonomia, and it basically that glides into our English word economy, an administration or an economy, that which is the age of the church. And just the word dispensation itself just means to disperse something. And in fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And Paul said that in 1 Corinthians, and it's talking about him dispensing the gospel. He distributed and dispensed the responsibility to Paul to preach the gospel to every creature. And if you listen to these dispensationalists, they will, they will tell you that dispensationalism is the key doctrine to understanding scripture, understanding salvation. If you don't get dispensationalism, you're not gonna get anything right. You must have dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is the foundation for that. If you don't have that, you will never find the truth in the Word of God. Here's a question I have for you. If dispensationalism is the key doctrine that is needed for the understanding of Scripture, then why was it invented 1800 years after Christ? You know, there's a lot of people who are saved that are adhering to the doctrine of dispensationalism and their faith is being overthrown. They're believing all kinds of heresy and false doctrine that's going to affect them in the long run. And it's because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not comparing scripture with scripture. The reason we're preaching on this is because we don't want to be children tossed to and fro, cared about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You see, dispensationalists are tricky. But a soul will live forever someplace, and I wouldn't want you burning. I want you happy with God and Jesus Christ. That's why I preach to you. And just like any other false religion, what they do is they'll use some truth, right? Because the fact of the matter is, most dispensationalists, guess what they are? They're King James only. Our final, absolute final authority in all matters of faith and practice is the Bible. Supposedly, right? So they get their foot in the door in independent fundamental Baptist churches under the guise of being King James only. But then what do they do? They bring in their leaven and a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. Believing the King James Bible is the absolute perfect word of God is ridiculous. It is. But it's way down on a long list of ridiculous things that we believe. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1, the Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. You know what I never call Jesus Christ? I never call him my Messiah. So the Bible's teaching us here that there will be false teachers even among us. And let's just go ahead and, and, and apply it to independent Baptists. There's a whole lot of dispensational false teachers out there who are independent yeah. Baptist circles. I mean, for decades, they've influenced the independent Baptists to believe these her heretical teachings. Yeah. 
The reason that that's important is because today it is the independent Baptists that have the Word of God, that have the true salvation, that are the ones that are actually doing what God has called them to do. You know, one of my goals in life is before I die or retire or get incarcerated or whatever's going to happen, you know, before I'm done, I would like our movement to just completely abolish and, uh, and destroy Ruckmanism and their heresies and their doctrines. And one way we're going to do that is by just facing dispensationalism and destroying it. Because that's our goal. Our goal, and we're not hiding it, is to destroy dispensationalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To bury it in the ground six feet deep that it never comes back. But if you let me hang around, I'll be after your soul. I'm out to get it. came up with this? Who are the men responsible for these perverse teachings? Who are the grievous wolves arising, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? Who are they? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know how many false teachers who teach dispensationalists are upheld as being these great men of God? There are basically uh, some major names when it comes to dispensationalism. One is John Nelson Darby. The other one is Clarence Larkin. One is C.I. Schofield. And then for independent Baptists, the fourth major name would be Peter Ruckman. In Great Britain, there is a sect called the Plymouth Brethren. And uh, they were a very radical sect. Uh, John Nelson Darby was a, uh, I, I guess you would describe him as a disgruntled Anglican uh, cleric. He actually was pushed out of the Anglican Communion. Yes, he was pushed right? out of the Anglican Communion. There was nothing especially radical about dividing history into periods. What separated Darby's dispensationalism was his novel method of biblical interpretation. Very novel, you know. Dispensations only mentioned four times in the Bible. He put seven. Probably no Christian thinker in the last 200 years has so affected the way in which English-speaking Christians view their faith and yet has received so little recognition of his contribution as John Nelson Darby. Yeah, John Nelson Darby was a man that lived in the 1800s. Who they would actually coin as being the father of dispensationalism. Here's all you need to know about this man, all right? He translated his own Bible. Here's the biggest problem. He made his own Bible. I mean, that's, you're done at that point. Now, people, they go against dispensationalism because the reason why they would go against dispensationalism is because Schofield, he was, when he published his uh, reference Bible, it was part of some kind of Illuminati conspiracy, they're going to say. They're going to go against Darby because he has his own reference Bible. So it's not the King James Version. Now, you say, well, you know, what's wrong with the Bible? I mean, you know, I'm sure he went to the Texas Receptus, you know, and he got, I mean, they should align somewhat. Well, let's look at how much they align. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 1, the King James Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of the circumcision? So when the Bible said, what advantage has the Jew? In other words, it's talking about that the oracles of God obviously were given to them. They had received the laws of God. They had an advantage in the fact that they knew God and understood God. Right? The word of God was revealed to the Hebrews in the Old Testament. That's the advantage that they had. God gave them the word of God. And he committed unto them the responsibility to propagate the word of God throughout the whole earth. To evangelize the Gentiles. That's the advantage. Now keep in mind that one of the heresies of dispensationalism is Zionism. We know what happens to Israel. If we, those that follow the scriptures, it's very clear, Israel's not going away. Um, 
Do you sense the, the hope with those people, with the people of Israel? Do you sense that they understand the reality? I, because I, I do see this, that they know God has a special plan for that country. Well, John Nelson Darby, look what he says. What then is the superiority of the Jews? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Now, hold on a second. What then is the superiority of the Jews? The Bible doesn't say they're superior. The Bible says they had an advantage. He wants to show that the Jews are more superior than anybody else. It doesn't say superior, it says advantage. You know, but of course, a Zionist would say, oh no, the Jews are superior to Gentiles. You know, we're just a bunch of dirty heathen Gentiles and they're superior than us. No, you know what? The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says that we're all made of one blood. He, here's the thing. The, what's the difference between a Jew, the Old Testament Jew, and the, the Gentiles? Here's the difference. The Jews had an advantage. They were given the oracles of God. They were given the laws of God. But were they superior? Were they created better than the Gentiles? No, but not according to John Darby. Yeah, he's just off a little bit. Well, strike one. God's doing something now. But think about this. Now we are coming to love Israel and understand that God still has a purpose. The church is. The Gentile church, I should say. Luke 2, 33 says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So the Bible, the King James Bible, was very careful not to call Joseph Jesus Christ's dad. Why is that? Because he wasn't. God is his father, right? But in Luke chapter 2 and verse 33, John Nelson Darby translated it as this, And his father and mother wondered at the things which were said concerning him. So in John Nelson Darby's version, God is not the father of Jesus, but Joseph was the father of Jesus. It takes out Joseph's name and puts his father. You say, no, you're reading from the NIV. No, this is John Nelson Darby's Bible. John 16, 8 says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Talking about who? The Holy Ghost, right? What did John Nelson Darby say? And having come, he will bring demonstration of the world of sin. So the Holy Ghost is going to teach me how to, he's going to demonstrate how to sin? <laughs> Taught him how to do it, but it wasn't the Holy Ghost. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, in the King James Bible says this, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. John Nelson Darby, his version says, For they themselves relate concerning us what entering in we had to you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Now you might think, well, what was the difference? Here's the difference. King James says, the living and true God. John Nelson Darby says, a living and true God. Now, let me ask you a question. Is our God a living and true God? He's just one of the living and true gods, you know, along with every other. No, he's not a living and true God. He is the living and true God. There's only one God. There's only one Lord that we serve. Second John 1, 7, the Bible says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So he says this, the Bible says, confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh, right? Because he came. Yeah. Well, what does his version say? For many deceivers have gone out into the world. They who do not confess Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, you can look at different versions of the, of the Bible and they'll read very similar to Darby's version of the Bible. This isn't semantics and this isn't a small issue. This is proof that even in John Nelson Darby's version of the Bible, a purposeful effort is being made to condition people for the new world order. How about this in Acts 8.37? Our King James Bible says this, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you want to be baptized, you must first believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we don't baptize babies. That's why we don't baptize unbelievers. Why? Because you must first believe on Christ. You must have a clear testimony of salvation. And then you can be baptized. But what does the John Nelson Darby version say? Well, it says nothing. Because if you open it up to Acts 8.37, the verse is missing. 
And you say, was that that big of a deal? Well, the fact that the verse that explains that salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and that you must believe on Him in order to be saved and then be baptized is removed is an attack on the doctrine of salvation. 10, I'm going to read to you from Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So the Bible teaches us that we receive the forgiveness of sins, the redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, John Nelson Darby doesn't believe that. He says, in whom we receive redemption, the forgiveness of sins, not through the blood. So you notice that there's these subtle changes, these systematic changes to promote false doctrine. Yeah. You say, well, what's the big deal? You know, I mean, yeah, he was off on those things, but he was right on the pre-tribulation doctrine. He was right about the Jews. You're following a guy who wrote his own Bible, who inserted his own theology and ideologies and false teachings within that Bible, and you're saying that those two doctrines are right? You see, today you have these dispensational Baptists who will ardently fight against the NIV. They'll take a stand against the ESV and these modern perversions of the Bible, yet their foundation for eschatology and their foundation for their view on Israel stems from a man who wrote a Bible that reads just like these modern versions. No, that's your golden calf that you need to melt and be poured down your throat. Amen. And, and really, um, I think, so far overreached itself that it, 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 it just chopped up the Bible and lost a sense of right the unity. What resulted from Darby's departure was a new way of viewing the church and history that still pervades much of evangelical Christian thought today. It is positively stated in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that the church would fail and become as bad as the heathens. That's what he said. So he sees himself as some church savior. You see, if you're claiming to bring in a new way, you're basically stating that you're doing something that's never been done before. So this argument by Gene Kim that states that during the Dark Ages, no one had the Word of God, and in the 1800s, John Nelson Darby came on the scene and began to reinforce something that was taught before, is a fallacy. Why? Because John Nelson Darby specifically said, I'm bringing in a new way. So. You say, what do we need to know about John Nelson Darby? Here's what we need to know about John Nelson Darby, the father of dispensationalism. The man who invented dispensationalism was not even saved. One of the greatest books you can get on dispensations is this book by Clarence Larkin, the greatest book on dispensational truth in the world. Clarence Larkin can be referred to as John Nelson Darby's scribe. He simply took the teachings of Darby and made systematic charts that basically would illustrate their dispensational truth. This guy was born in 1850, he died in 1924. John Nelson Darby created it, but Clarence Larkin packaged it. Because dispensationalism is so complicated, you need like multiple charts to even try to grasp it. At the age of 21, he became a professional draftsman, an architect, which would later aid him in publicizing his book, the greatest book on dispensational truth in the world. I mean, that sounds like a real humble guy, right? I mean, he writes a book on dispensationalism. He titles it, the greatest book on dispensationalism in the world. This is one of the first books I, I read after I got saved and I could not put it down. The Bible is amazing. The Bible is a, just an amazing, amazing book. And if you talk to dispensationalism, they're always telling you, Clarence Larkin's books, you got to read his books, you got to study his charts. You know, he is the man that packaged it. He is the man that made it basically formatted in a way where these people could grasp it and understand it. Clarence Larkin was actually an Episcopalian. But in 1882, the same year that John Nelson Darby died, he converted to become a Baptist. And in fact, two years after his so-called conversion, he was ordained to be a Baptist pastor. It was during this time that he began to adopt and adhere to the tenets of dispensationalism, drawing and designing the dispensational charts. Then in 1918, he completed his work on dispensational truth. What's interesting about, about Clarence Larkin is, you know, he was an architect. And the Freemasons will use that phrase about God. And Clarence Larkin used a lot of terminology that actually aligns with the occult. He used a lot of symbolism and drawings that, that fall right in hand with what the Rosicrucians taught. 
Now the Rosicrucians are a secret society inside of the Catholic Church. Rosicrucian simply means rosy cross. That was their symbol. And a lot of the occult teachings and drawings that he did, you can actually line it up hand to hand with Hermes and the Kabbalah. And there are several different traditions that refer to themselves as Kabbalah. And within each of this, there are different practices and techniques. First, the term Kabbalah refers to the esoteric or mystical aspect of Judaism. During the European Renaissance, concepts and methods from Jewish Kabbalah were adopted by some Christian scholars and integrated into their Christian theology, giving rise to what is called Christian Kabbalah. One thing that people don't understand about Clarence Larkin is that within his book, he lays a very solid foundation, not for biblical teaching, but rather for the New World Order. For example, in his book, The Dispensational Truth, on page 164, he has an entire section dedicated to expounding on the Great Pyramid. He's really got some fascinating stuff in there. In fact, he's got some work on the pyramids uh, that is often overlooked and that some people think is kind of kooky and might be kind of kooky, I don't know, but uh, uh, it is definitely worth considering and looking at. And he comes at it from a logic uh, point of view, not a, not a, a biblical point of view. And in fact, he says here in Dispensational Teaching of the Great Pyramid, it was not built for a tomb, as were the others, but embodies in its construction such a wonderful knowledge of mathematics, astronomy, and scriptural information as to clearly show that the architect and builder was especially endowed with divine wisdom. Then he goes on to quote Job 38, verse 4 through 7, where it says, Where was thou when I had laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And when commenting on Job 38, he states this, The building referred to in the above passage must therefore be one with which Job was familiar. And to what can it better refer then to the great pyramid of which, as we shall see, Job was the probable builder. For what other form of building is there that has four foundation stones and a capstone or a head cornerstone, but a pyramid? So according to Clarence Larkin, he believes that the great pyramid is symbolic of what God was referring to in Job chapter 38. This great pyramid that is missing the capstone. Now keep in mind that Egypt has never been used in the Bible to symbolize anything godly. It's never been used to symbolize anything pure or holy. On the contrary, it's always been used to symbolize the world. It's always been used to symbolize paganism and idolatry. And yet Clarence Larkin in his book is associating a pagan structure in Egypt and relating it to Jesus Christ. He's using the Great Pyramid of Egypt and he's claiming that the capstone that's missing from the Great Pyramid of Egypt is in reference to Jesus Christ. He said, well, that's just a coincidence. You know, Clarence Larkin is just using capstone and cornerstone interchangeably. They mean the same thing, but they don't mean the same thing. You see, the cornerstone is at the foundation. The capstone is at the top. If you look at the back of an American dollar, you will see the Great Pyramid of Egypt on it. And right above it is a capstone with the Eye of Horus embedded in it. And what is the Eye of Horus? Well, it's simply an occultic symbolic representation of Lucifer. You see, Jesus Christ is not the capstone according to the King James Bible. He's the cornerstone. And when Job 38 states, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, that is a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has already taken place. Whereas the capstone that belongs on the Great Pyramid of Egypt has not yet been laid. Clarence Larkin's book is simply conditioning people for the New World Order. It's not a book to teach any biblical doctrine. It's a book to condition people for the New World Order. He says, listen, this is Clarence Larkin speaking. He says, they are not angels. Angels have bodies. He says, these are disembodied spirits. Clarence Larkin is teaching that a demon is a disembodied spirit. He's saying it was somebody that was once alive, that is now in hell, that can come back up as a spirit and possess other people. 
I, I disagree with a couple of things in, in his work, uh, just as I do Schofield's work. Both of them hold to a gap theory. Oh, there's a comma there. I'll bet you in between that comma, there was a judgment. There was a whole nother world that existed and all those people that God destroyed before Adam, they're now in hell and they come and go as they please because they're demons. This is what he taught. This is the doctrine of devils. The Bible says that you need that no man teach you. If you've got the Holy Ghost and the King James Bible and you're saved, you should be able to read and understand the Bible on your own. But yet today we're told we need Clarence Larkin and we need his books. If you use this man's drawings or, or Schofield's notes as a crutch for your learning and understanding of the Word of God, then you will begin to doubt the things of God. All dispensationalists just hail Clarence Larkin and his books as the best tool for Bible study. And here's what they literally believe. They believe you cannot understand the Word of God without Clarence Larkin. Well, that's already an attack on biblical teaching. If Satan can draw you away from the Word of God, he basically can render you useless. The only thing that makes us useful, aside from the fact that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us, is that we know the Bible. Okay? We know the Bible. We know how to use the Bible. We can rightly divide the word of truth. But you know what? If you have someone telling you, hey, you can't understand the word of God without Clarence Larkin's commentary, you know, that's going to render you useless. Why? Because at that point, you've placed his book over the authority of the book. Right. And you know, John Nelson Darby is the man that created dispensationalism. He's the father of dispensationalism. Clarence Larkin basically packaged dispensationalism. He wrote the books that made it available for people to learn and understand. But it was really C.I. Schofield who distributed dispensationalism. And he did that through the Schofield Reference Bible. There's a third man who had a huge impact on dispensational theology, and his name is C.I. Schofield. If you have a Schofield reference Bible, uh, you need to know the author of that reference Bible, because he's not the person you think he is. He's not Dr. Schofield. He never was a doctor. Theater. He never was a doctor, all right? Never, ever. He was born in 1843, died in 1921. This guy was a criminal and a deceiver, and he popularized the writings of John Nelson Darby with the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, Nelson Darby is the man who created dispensationalism, and uh, Larkins basically packaged it in his books, but it was Schofield who distributed it. John Nelson Darby's crazy doctrines went nowhere. They stayed in Great Britain among the Plymouth Brethren all through the 1800s. And there were uh, only pockets of people in the United States who even knew about it, that, that gave it any kind of, uh, of respect. But then there was uh, Cyrus Schofield, and Schofield became the, the, the propaganda meister for John Nelson Darby's uh, Doctrine. Basically what the Schofield Reference Bible is, it's a Bible, a King James Bible, that has his notes added to the margins, where basically his notes act as a commentary on the Word of God. And in that commentary, he basically taught dispensational truth. This Bible was shipped around the world. Many of the contributors to the uh... Uh, Schofield Reference Bible, which is what more than anything else swept the, this movement across the United States. Right. Somebody financed the publication of a vast number of Schofield Bibles and suddenly these things were being mailed out to churches all over America. It was given to Baptist uh, young preachers in their seminaries and Bible colleges and this is how dispensationalism was really distributed into the pulpits and into the hands of preachers all across the country. Yeah, conferences were really important and uh, the establishment of Bible colleges and Dallas Theological Seminary, that was all part of a concerted effort to spread this dispensational movement 
that was very successful for a time. And so these Bibles were getting distributed all over, uh, you know, rural America, small town churches. Millions, uh, millions. All over. And uh, the Bible salesmen would get the Bibles for free. They began publishing and giving them away for free to Bible students and seminaries. And Moody Bible was a big one in Texas. And then they would sell them for whatever amount that they could get out of it. Well, how would they get them for free? They, the company that was publishing them obviously wanted to get their Bibles out there. Well, that was Oxford. That's right. So Oxford gave away the Bibles. Right. Now, this publication was originally supposed to be published using the revised version, the 1884 Catholic Bible. C.I. Schofield is actually a guy who's placed on a pedestal by the Independent Fundamental Baptist. In fact, if you go to the pulpits of America, you will find a Schofield reference Bible. Yet this is a guy who preferred to use the revised version over the King James for his references. And the only reason he used the King James 1611 is because of its popularity at the time. They, they said, no, 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 let's, let's use the authorized version. Let's use the King James version so we'll have more widespread acceptance. If they'll accept it for which Bible version it is, then maybe they'll look at your footnotes and begin to trust it. So he basically said, threw the King James Bible under the bus and said, it's not a good one, but we're going to use it because it's the most popular. Really? So why are Baptists, King James only, promoting this heretic who was downplaying and hating on the King James Bible as being some man of God who can teach us good doctrine? They were infiltrating the American evangelical churches with Zionist propaganda. And slowly, all right, the Baptists bought into it. And most Baptists do not agree with all the footnotes of Schofield. Most Baptists will even say, I don't even, I don't think Schofield was saved because he was wrong here or there. And it's like, well then why do you trust it? They, they trust his writings and his view on the rapture and dispensationalism as if he is an authority. Because you don't want the public to know the truth about Cyrus Schofield. But he was not a doctor of anything, a doctor of buffoonery. Right. The Pentecostals bought into it, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God. You just go down the list of, of, of Pentecostal and Baptist denominations that got suckered into this thing. Yeah, and people actually believe the notes are as sacred as the texts that are there. I have a Schofield Bible, and I just want to read Schofield's notes out of the bottom about Acts 15. He says, dispensationally, this is the most important passage in the New Testament. It gives the divine purpose for this age and for the beginning of the next. And again, this guy, this guy was a deceiver. He was a criminal, and I, I don't use that phrase lightly. First, he embellished his Civil War record. When he was not yet 18, Cyrus gave his age as 21 and enlisted in the 7th Regiment of the Tennessee Infantry. He embellished it. He, he, he made up stuff. He, he made people believe he was a hero. He was a hero at Antietam. This ex-Confederate soldier solemnly swore that he had never borne arms against the United States. That was rank perjury. In 1873, he was arrested in, in prison for signing a false oath of office by lying. An article on December 14, 1873, in the Daily Times of Leavenworth suggested something was amiss in the DA's office. A case was pending against ex-Senator Pomeroy, and there were hints that Pomeroy had paid Cyrus to keep the case from coming to trial. Listen to me, folks. Cyrus Schofield was forced to resign as U.S. District Attorney of Kansas under a cloud of scandal, including bribery. Yes, and land transfers and yes, yes some very questionable he practices. He embezzled money out of people. Though he was responsible for the support of a family of four, he disappeared for a period of three to five years. One acquaintance said Schofield had a bad reputation and just skedaddled out of town. He abandoned his wife and children. And then he wrote letters saying, I have an investment, I need $1,300. And he got his wife that he had abandoned to ask her mom for the $1,300. And he then sent them a forged document. 
Oh, here's the investment. He took the money and ran, abandoned his children. I mean, this guy's a wicked person. Yeah, yeah. To do that to children? Later, a church issued Schofield a license to preach. And he ends up in Dallas, Texas, and becomes the pastor of the First Congregational Church of Dallas. Now, he marries a woman from the church, but he doesn't tell the church that he abandoned his wife right. and children back in, in Kansas. Kansas. About the time that Cyrus was licensed to preach, or ordained to preach, Leontine Schofield, this is his Catholic wife, by the way, had divorce papers drawn up. And filed for, on charges of abandonment. Right. All right. So this is the record of, of Cyrus Schofield. Well, here's what the Bible says about a man like that. It says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The men of God that stand up to teach us theology and teach us the Word of God, the Bible has given us qualifications for those men. You say, well, what's the problem with that? You know, he had a reference Bible. It's helped a lot of people. It's enlightened a lot of people in regards to dispensationalism. What's the problem with giving someone like him a license to preach? Well, here's the problem. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says this. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And the fact of the matter is, is that C.I. Schofield violated most of those. Oh, you're just attacking his character. You know what? Character matters. And God put qualifications on pastors for a reason. If it didn't matter, then why did God put qualifications for the men of God that are supposed to be teaching us the Word of God? Here's all I'm trying to explain to you. C.I. Schofield was not qualified to stand up and teach the Word of God to anybody. Indeed, the shape of fundamentalism, which has claimed to be the orthodox Christianity, has been determined by the influence of a dubious character like Schofield. Why? Because he was not blameless. Why? Because he did not have a good report. Why? Because he did not even provide for his own family. He was worse than an infidel. So what do we learn about the founders of, of, of dispensationalism? We learn that one is an infidel and the other one's worse than an infidel. We learn that one is an infidel and the other one can't even support his own family. This is the first time they've heard any of this. So. Yeah. They've got this new information. Where do they go from here? What do they do with this information? Well, if you got a Schofield Bible, throw it in the trash. I suppose if he came right now, I wonder how it would go. Well, you got five quarts of blood in you. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So what happens? The Tim LaHaye couldn't find, and Hal Lindsey couldn't find, and none of them could find. You find when you go, all your clothes collapse there in that place you're sitting, and that five quarts of blood just sops those clothes clear through with blood. And five quarts here, five quarts there, five quarts here, five here, five here, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty, one hundred, two hundred, three hundred quarts of blood all over that beautiful carpet. <laughs> and all of them beautiful seats just soaked in blood. When we're talking about the founders of dispensationalism and those who promoted it, one name I want to bring up is the name of Peter S. Ruckman. Peter Ruckman is kind of like the father of a lot of these Baptist churches when it comes to who they look back to. Peter Ruckman is really the man that brought dispensationalism into the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And he has birthed these bastards such as Gene Kim. Right. Such as Robert Breaker. Right. These are the bastard children of Peter Ruckman. Amen. You know, a lot of people think that Peter Ruckman is a great man of God. Well, you know what? Why is it that in 2018, everyone who is a fan of Peter Ruckman and loves Peter Ruckman isn't saved? You know what I mean? What does that say about that man when all of his followers are a bunch of damnable heretics? 
they all look back to Ruckman and what he taught, but he had a lot of weird views, and the fact that he believed that people were saved differently in the Old Testament is enough to call him a heretic. Peter Ruckman and his Ruckmanites today are the ones who have brought this heresy in to the IFB movement. C.I. Schofield brought it into conservative fundamentalism back in the 1800s. That was not the independent fundamental Baptist movement. You fast forward, you know, many years later, you've got a lot of liberalism that causes a group of, of churches to take on the name of independent fundamental Baptists, not connected to a den denomination, but we were, you know, zealous, soul-winning fundamentalist Christians. And Peter Ruckman was able to infiltrate the IFB movement. Peter Ruckman is very highly esteemed among Baptists, probably more so because of his stance on the King James Bible. But Peter Ruckman also taught that the English King James Bible trumped the Greek New Testament. But let me just give you some of his weird beliefs. Number one, he did not believe abortion was murder. And so I don't teach that abortion is a uh, murder like the brethren do, and for that uh, reason I'm considered a heretic to some of the brethren. So basically it could be nine months uh, you know, a nine-month baby in the womb, but if they didn't take the first breath, then you can kill that baby. Number two, having a physical relationship with someone makes you married. He taught, you know, he taught that there's no difference between fornication and adultery. If, if you have a physical relationship with someone, you're married to them. And you say, that's weird. Yeah, you know, when you've been married three times, you probably want to just try to, like, not make marriage that special. Number three, he believed that everyone becomes a 33-year-old man in heaven. Ladies, I hope you're excited for that. Look what the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Because here's the thing, this man was not a Baptist, he was not saved, he was not, uh, you know, doesn't believe the things we believe, but he was able to come in and bring all of his false doctrine and false teaching. When you look to the preachers and the missionaries and the pastors, you look on their fruit. You, you say, I, I, which one's of God? Oh, what's the fruit? Check the fruit. The tree is known by his fruit. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Here's the timeline of Peter Ruckman's life. 1921, Peter S. Ruckman was born November 19th in Wilmington, Delaware. 1944, married Janie Bess May in March and graduated from the University of Alabama. 1949, made a profession of faith on the 14th of March and enrolled in Bob Jones University in the fall. 1950, ordained into the ministry in a Southern Baptist church. 1954, began to teach that salvation was by works during the Great Tribulation. 1959, his first wife deserted him, according to his side of the story. 1962, his first wife divorced him. 1972, married Sherry Rubin, divorced wife of one of his former students at Pensacola Bible Institute and submitted resignation to Brent Baptist Church after a third of the congregation voted against him. 1988, his second wife divorced him. 1989, married for third time to Pamela Irene Huggins, a member of his church who was 27 years younger also guessed that the rapture would occur between the 14th of May and the 20th of June of 1989. So he's setting dates for the rapture. 2009 published the Ruckman Reference Bible. 2016 died April 21st. 2018 
Ruckman's fifth child, Peter Ruckman Jr., allegedly killed his two sons before taking his own life in an apparent murder-suicide discovered on March 3rd. And again, you say, oh, well, that's just his personal life, his private life. Just remember, God gave us qualifications for a reason. This guy couldn't rule not only a wife, he couldn't rule three wives. You see, Peter Ruckman is praised as this great man of God who taught the multitudes. And they praise Peter Ruckman as being some, some, some wonderful man. And, and what does the Bible say? He's like a minister of righteousness. But you know what his end's going to be? According to his works. Yeah. According to the Bible. We're beginning by just talking about these founders of dispensationalism, you know, exposing uh, the founders and examining the founders. And what we find is this, every single one of these men is not someone we should be listening to for theology. It's not someone that we should be listening to to understand the word of God. And they say, yeah, but you know, John Nelson Darby had his issues and C.I. Schofield had issues and you know, Peter Ruckman, he had his failures and his issues, but you know, at the end of the day, we can still learn from these men. At the end of the day, we can still glean wisdom from these teachers. Really? You know, do men gather grapes of thorns? Well, can you get figs of thistles? Can we glean wisdom and proper fruits from these corrupt trees? You cannot, according to them, understand doctrine. You can't understand the Bible. You can't understand basic salvation without having an understanding of dispensationalism. You know, they'll say, well, you know, I don't agree with C.I. Schofield and the fact that he believed and taught the gap theory. Right. But you know what? I do believe in Zionism. I do believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. Who can bring a clean doctrine out of an unclean tree such as John Nelson Darby? Not one. Who can bring a clean doctrine out of an unclean resource such as C.I. Schofield and Peter Ruckman? Not one. Is it possible to extract good doctrine from a bad tree? Well, according to Matthew 7, it's impossible. Amen. Why? Because you can't get good fruit from a bad tree. And you know what? John Nelson Darby was a bad tree. We can't do it with Joseph Smith. We can't do it with Charles Case Russell. We can't do it from Joel Olstein and from any other corrupt tree. So John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield, and Peter Ruckman are not the exception. You see, they're safe people. Baptists, saved. They believe in, once saved, always saved. But they're being deceived by the dispensationalists. Because they've been ingrained to think and to believe uh, the subject regarding the Jews. They've been ingrained to think and to believe this matter of the pre-tribulation rapture, this false fallacy of the church age, and the false teaching of the misconception of the times of the Gentiles, and all these teachings that have been ingrained in them, they think they're being disloyal to the Bible by not believing in those things. No, you're actually adhering to the Bible if you reject those things. Amen. We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in dividing verses to the right group of people and the right time period. Because if you don't divide the verses, then you're going to combine them all together and come up with a bunch of major wrong doctrine. You see, the most damnable heresy of dispensationalism is this teaching that people were saved differently throughout the Bible, that there are different gospels. So there, there are several different Gospels in the Bible. There's at least five different Gospels in the Bible. So that's why it's so important to understand dispensationalism to see where are we in the Bible and which Gospel is to us. But the problem with that is, is that in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 10, verse 43, the Bible says that to him, speaking of Christ, give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's talking about the prophets of the Old Testament where the dispensationalists will say well they had a different gospel it was by faith and by works but the Bible tells us that their message was that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. The Bible is very clear that that a man is not justified by the deeds of the law and that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us 
And Romans chapter 4 flat out destroys this, this dispensational argument. So it says here that if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then David, he was in the Old Testament. And David said that he spake of the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed the righteousness without works. How in the world could we use David as an illustration of being saved without works if they were saved by works in the Old Testament? Can you explain that to me? And then Jesus, who brought in the New Test Testament, and he was coming at the tail end of the Old Testament, said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See how this dispensational salvation is the most foolish, unbiblical garbage that just completely contradicts what we're reading in Scripture. And they say ridiculous things like, People are saved the same in the Old Testament as the New Testament, or people in the Old Testament are saved by looking forward to the cross, and people in the New Testament are look, saved by looking backwards to the cross. Just ridiculous things. And so, from before the Old Testament, during the order of Melchizedek, it was by faith, not by works. During the Old Testament, David said it was by faith, not by works. And right even before the New Testament even started at the death of Christ, Jesus is saying it's faith not by works. Specifically, Robert Breaker will say salvation was different in the Old Testament. In fact, with Adam and Eve, it was by works. Because they did not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But here's the problem with that. Before Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they weren't sinners. They were innocent, meaning they were not in need of salvation. It wasn't after they ate of the tree. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So how can it be that they were saved by not eating of the tree when they didn't need salvation until after they ate of the tree? They weren't sinners until after they ate of the tree. You go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it tells us the only way to be saved is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How could someone have been saved back here that way if Jesus hadn't died yet, wasn't buried, and rose again? And he says, see, the prophets had a different message. They didn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't talk about Christ. They, taught, they said they had to be saved by works. Well, let's see if that's true. Go to Acts chapter 26. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Now, what did they say? Look at verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. That's the prophets. That's Moses in the Old Testament. So Moses was preaching that. The prophets were preaching that. John the Baptist preached that. And the apostle Paul preached that. He says, I'm not saying anything different. But you know what Robert Breaker says? No, these guys are liars. The prophets didn't, didn't talk about Jesus. <laughs> hey, they're liars. So if this is the same message that the prophets spoke and Moses spoke, why didn't he insert works as well? Because they say, no, it's by believing and by works as well. Well, what was the witness? That through his name, through his name. Well, they didn't know the name of Jesus. He was called the Lord. Amen. Amen. That works in conjunction with every other gospel presentation that we see in the Bible. Nothing different. People back here weren't saved the same way that we are today. The only way that you can say they are all saved the same is they were all saved by God's grace. And I would agree with you. God has always had grace on people to save them. Noah, the Bible says, found grace in God's eyes. Over here, we're saved by grace through faith. But then we looked at a verse that people that are under the law had to live in the, that law and do the works. So there were some works involved in the law. In old Noah, there were some works involved. Had Noah not built that boat, none of us would be here today. 
Well, we're not told to build a big boat. So do you see how God deals differently with different people in different time periods? Bunch of liars. Yeah. Bunch of perverse liars. Yeah. You know, why don't you really <laughs> divide the word of truth? Why don't you go read Acts chapter 26? Why don't you read Acts chapter 10? Why don't you read the rest of the Bible? Why don't you compare scripture with scripture? You know why? Because you're a natural man and the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. Yeah. Neither can he know them for they're spiritually discerned. But these stupid dispensationists want to get up and say, see, there's different gospels. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. That's exactly what these people are. And he specifically said this. I couldn't believe that he said this. Let's say the rapture takes place and I'm gone. And you're watching this video on YouTube or someplace. And you're just like, wow, the rapture happened. We were really in this time period, and there's a man over the whole world that took over, and he says, now everyone's got to take this mark. And you weren't thinking, and you took a little RFID chip in your, in your hand. And you think, well, what do I do? How, how can I? Because when Jesus comes, he's going to put me in hell because I took that mark. The Bible told me not to. Look what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 30. Matthew 5, 30, he says, and if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. I'll tell you what, if you're in the tribulation and you took that mark of the beast in your hand, you're going to have to cut that hand off. Well, if that's not a work, I don't know what is. It's best not to take the mark. But if you take it, chop it off. You say, well, what about those people that take the mark in their, in their forehead? Uh, well... <laughs> And I can't believe to say people will listen to this stupidity and not say, what in the world is this guy talking about? Hit the X button on the computer, turn him off, yeah. shoot him an email and say, you're a heretic. Amen. And you know what? If I have to choose between my Lord and Savior being a false prophet or Sam Gipp being a false prophet, then you know what? Let Sam Gipp be accursed. Let Bill Grady be accursed. Let all these guys, Gene, Kim, Robert Breaker, let them die and go to hell if they want to reject the gospel of Christ. It's been the same salvation all throughout history. It's always been about Christ. Now, a lot of people will foolishly disregard the Old Testament, not want to talk about the Old Testament, and they'll kind of have this dispensationalist attitude of, well, you know, that was written to them, and that was written for them, you know, but we're in the New Testament, so this is written for us. But the Bible's telling us here in 1 Corinthians 10 that those things were actually written for us, even more so than they were written for them. And in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So according to the Bible, if I'm going to be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, I need all scripture. The Bible is written to us. The Bible is given to us. But not all the Bible is for us. All these things happened unto them for in samples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And what the Bible is teaching here in this scripture is that the things that happened in the Old Testament, those stories that he alluded to a little bit earlier in the chapter, were examples unto us. And the Bible says that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Does the Bible even use the word dispensation? Well, as a matter of fact, it does. Four times in the Bible do we find the term dispensation. By the way, it's only mentioned in the New Testament. So if there's seven dispensations, and most of them are before the dispens dispensation of grace, okay, then why in the world wasn't it mentioned back then? Here's what you need to understand. Dispensationalists teach that every dispensation was a test that God gave to man. Mankind fails their dispensation. Which is why they say that every dispensation ends with evil, it ends with judgment. And God basically has to start over and try again a different way. Dispensation number one, innocence. That's 
from the creation to the fall. Dispensation number two, conscience. That's from the fall to the flood. Dispensation number three, human government. That's from the flood to Abraham. Dispensation number four, promise. That's from Abraham to Moses. Dispensation number five, the law. That's from Moses to the cross. Dispensation number six, grace. That's from the cross to the rapture. Dispensation number seven, the kingdom. That's from the rapture through the millennium. You know, you have the dispensation of innocence and Adam and Eve's sin. You say, what is the Edenic dispensation? Everything was conditioned on, don't eat the tree. You have the dispensation of conscience and it ends with the flood. And you're gonna do right and men had to follow their conscience. And it was the time in which men lived before the law. And basically, in the dispensation of conscience, people were supposed to just be led by their conscience. They're, it's like the Jiminy Cricket dispensation, right? You're just supposed to be led by your conscience and do right, you know? But you know what's interesting is that in that dispensation, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And with Cain and Abel, they both brought a sacrifice to God. Abel brings the lamb and the Cain brings of the fruit of the ground. You know, it's interesting because the Bible says that God did not accept one and he accepted the other one. But if it was the dispensation of conscience, why didn't God just go ahead and accept Cain's sacrifice? I mean, he was obviously bringing what he thought was the best thing. But that just goes to show you that it's never been follow your conscience. It's always been, you know, what God says and what his word tells us. So then he's like, oh, what am I going to do this time? So now he's at the dispensation of human government. And look, if you've ever been to the DMV, you know this dispensation is doomed. So when you get to the fifth dispensation, and that's the dispensation of the law, they'll say that people were saved by keeping the law. And you know, the dispensation of the law goes from Moses to the cross of Christ. So when we get into the New Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of those books are actually still, according to them, under the dispensation of the law. But of course, you know, they, the Jews really messed that one up. Because you know how that one ends? They accidentally crucify the Savior. So every time that God is giving us a test, we fail and we mess up. So then God has to basically bring judgment and then he starts over with a new dispensation. And literally this is what dispensationalists believe. They believe that God takes the Jews because they crucified Christ and he puts them on a timeout. He, God tells the Jews, go to your room, you know? And he basically just temporarily deals with the Gentiles because he's mad at the Jews for, you know, killing his son. And God gets mad again. He's like, ah, oh, man, you guys keep messing this up. But here's the problem with the church age. You and I, we're going to mess that one up too. And that one's going to end, you know, all messed up. It's going to be so bad. God's going to have to rapture us out of here, right? He's going to have to send down his tribulation, which they confuse with the wrath of God. But then at least when he gets us out of here, he can go back to his favorites, the Jews. But really, the God of dispensationalism is a failing God because he just doesn't know how to deal with man. So he tries one thing. When that doesn't work, he tries another thing. When that doesn't work, he tries another thing. Isaiah 46, 10 says this, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning. And our God is not confused. He has a plan and he's been working his plan from the beginning. He doesn't have to start over and try a new thing. Look, our God was not surprised that Adam and Eve ate of the, God, uh, ate of the tree. Our God was not just taken aback when the Jews crucified Christ. Our God declared the end from the beginning, the Bible says. He had a plan, he had a, a process, he knew what was gonna happen. He's not trying one thing and that didn't work, so then he tries another thing and that didn't work. No, you know what? Our God has had a plan from the beginning. Dispensationalism is the catalyst in which the Zionism stuff comes out, the pre-trib stuff comes out. This is, Zy uh, dispensationalism is like their key to somehow unlocking those doctrines. To say that the world is in a state of shock this morning would be to understate the situation. The event seems to have taken place at the same time all over the world just about 25 minutes ago. Jumbo jets plummet to earth as they no longer have a pilot at the control. 
driverless buses and trains and subways and cars cause unimaginable disaster. Because when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it shows that the pre-tribulation rapture was never taught before. It was a mystery until the Apostle Paul. I've been studying the Bible for 50 years. I can't come up with a single verse anywhere in the Bible that teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Can you help me with that? Will you, will you tell me where the Bible teaches that? There are, there's this argument by post-tribbers that uh, the pre-trib rapture was ne uh, never taught until Darby. Now, this comes as a surprise and a disturbing shock to many who advocate this view. is when they discover that no one in the history of the church had ever articulated in its full-orbed form until the middle of the 19th century. It's a man by the name of John Nelson Darby associated with the Plymouth Brethren Movement who first uh, defended and art articulated this particular perspective. Uh, here's the problem though. They might say, well, why wasn't this taught then for a long time? Well, here's the thing. This is very easy. If you know your history about the Catholic Church, what happened? That's why it's called Dark Ages. The scriptures were locked up in monasteries. All they knew was Catholic doctrine. That's right. mm -hmm. You see that? So look, you have to give them a break. If this goes on for centuries without studying the Bible, Right doctrine would be lost during that time, see? You mean to tell me that the Lord Jesus Christ came down to this earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, established the local New Testament church. Men like Paul and Peter gave us the writings, the structure for this movement called the local New Testament church. But then we missed out on the key doctrine for 1800 years. They were so arrogant as to believe that they had knowledge that God didn't even give the apostles. You know, until John Nelson Darby came on the scene, no one could understand scripture, understand doctrine. Everybody had it all wrong until John Nelson Darby came in. I mean, does that really make sense to anybody? But prior to 1830, no one knew about these, these doctrines. No one, no one talked about the imminent return of Christ. No one talked about a pre-tribulation rapture. He believed that the Church of England had lost any notion of salvation by grace and that it had forsaken biblical ideas of what church should be. For Darby, it was time to start afresh with a new church and prepare Jesus' imminent second coming. They teach that the rapture happens before the tribulation. We believe that the rapture happens after the tribulation. You say, why do we believe that? Because that's what the Bible says. And so, Schofield comes back with a contract to publish John Nelson Darby's Zionist notes. The Zionist Jews infiltrated the Christian church in the early 1900s through Cyrus Schofield. He was their little puppet. They introduced Zionist propaganda into the churches by publishing Darby's notes in a Bible. So they defiled the Holy Bible. They defiled it. So dispensationalists are distorting and they're perverting the immutability of God. They seek to change that which God has not changed. They also try to keep the same that which God has already changed. A prime example of that is this matter of the Jews. And this is the heresy of Zionism. The worship of the Jews. Who has more Nobel Prizes than anybody else? The Jew. <laughs> Maybe that has something to do with why they're mad at the Jew. Maybe it's because they are smart. Alf, what was his name? Einstein? We obviously understand according to the Bible that the Jews were God's chosen people in the Old Testament. But the Bible says that when Jesus Christ came, he came into his own and his own received him not. And the Bible tells us that the kingdom of God was taken from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He said, you got the covenant. Now, he has never taken that covenant from Israel. Anybody that says he has, they better watch themselves because they're lying. They might lose their everlasting life. They just may lose their, their, their salvation. You say, you don't think they can lose their salvation. Well, maybe they can. Look at Hebrews chapter number eight, verse number six. But now hath he attained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, 
which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. It says in verse number eight, for finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, say the Lord. So according to the Bible in the New Testament, God does not regard the Jews. God does not regard the physical nation of Israel as being his people. Because here's what they teach. They'll say, oh, no, no, the promise was made to Abraham and his seed. So see, it's all the descendants of Abraham. That land belongs to all the descendants, all the physical descendants of Abraham. And God said, through your seed forever, that land over there in Palestine will be yours. And you know, the Jews weren't in that land for several thousand years. And then 1948, they got their land back. Say, oh, we got to give the land back to the Jews. You know what? No, we will give the land back to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's called the millennial reign. When we preach against the Jews, please understand this. You know, here's what we believe about the Jews. We believe that they're people like anybody else. And Judaism is a false religion like any other false religion. Say, oh, do you guys hate the Jews? No, you know what? The Jews need to get saved. The Jews need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ like anyone else. But they don't get a free pass because they were born Jewish. They don't get this free pass where like, oh, well, you know, God hates the Muslim, God hates the Hindu, but the Jew, I mean, the Jew is just, no, you know what? The Jew is a heathen unbeliever like everyone else. You say, who are the, the, we're supposed to bless the Jews and we're supposed to bless Abraham's seed and we're supposed to protect Abraham's seed and we're supposed to bless them that we might be blessed. But uh, you, then bless me. So oh, pray for the Jews, pray for Israel, bless Abraham's seed. If you want to bless Abraham's seed, bless me. You say, oh, I, thought, I thought the whole Bible was about the Jews. No, here's what you need to understand. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. That's the Holy Spirit. And ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Say, okay, Pastor Jimenez, you know, you've gone through all this dispensational stuff, and you've taught us about it. What do you want us to take away from, from these teachings? Here's what I want you to take away from it. That ye need not that any man teach you. Well, we need to reject dispensationalism. We need to make sure that we go back to the Word of God. We need to make sure that we're a people that is emphasizing the Bible and only the Bible. You, need, you know, we need a generation to rise up to say, I reject all commentaries. I reject Clarence Larkin. I reject Peter Ruckman. And I'm just going to go to the Bible. You don't, you say, I don't, I, I, if I don't read C.I. Schofield's notes, if I don't read uh, Clarence Larkin's books, if I don't uh, have these men teach me about dispensational theology, I won't understand scripture. That's not true. I can have confidence that the Holy Spirit resides within me and he can lead me into all truths. He can teach me all things whatsoever I need to learn. I can have confidence that this commentator can comment on these 66 different books. The Holy Spirit is sufficient to teach me these biblical truths. I don't need dispensationalism. In fact, if you have them teach you, you'll be confused and go into heresy because you know all they're dispensing is heresy. Amen. You say, can I understand the Bible all on my own? Yes, you can. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. You need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teacheth you of all things. We need a revival in this country of Christians who are going back simply to the, to the Word of God. What are we saying when we go back to the Word of God? We're having confidence that the Holy Spirit who resides within us can teach us. And that's all you need. So don't fall into this trap where people want to act like they're smarter than you and act like they've got all this insight, they've got all these doctrines, and you need them. You need that no man. You need no man. All you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. All you need is the Holy Spirit. All you need is the King James Bible. And you can understand the Word of God on your own. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9, 
But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, the Bible tells us that there's a lot of saved people out there who their eyes aren't seeing, their ears, they're not hearing. The word of God is not entering into their hearts. They don't see what God has prepared for them that love him. But look what it goes on to say. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You see, we need a revival again of going back to the book. No longer going to Clarence Larkin and his charts. Not going to Peter Ruckman and John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield's reference Bible. No, we need to go back to the actual Word of God, the King James Bible, and understand that the Holy Spirit can teach us all things. He can lead us into all truths. And ask Him, Lord, open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We need to go back to studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I mean, I always thought, you know, Robert Baker looked like a chipmunk. It's funny how these dispensationalists always look like something that they're not supposed to be. You know, like you have Sluter who looks like a dyke. <laughs> Sam Gibb reminds me of a dried up prune, you know. He really does look like that character from Lord of the Rings, doesn't he? What was it? Shmi? Schmeagle. J'aimerais vous poser une question. Si vous deviez mourir aujourd'hui, iriez-vous au ciel? Peut-être vous n'y avez jamais pensé, vous ne vous êtes peut-être jamais posé la question. Mais la Bible dit que vous pouvez être sûr à 100% d'avoir votre place au paradis. Selon la Bible, il y a certaines choses que vous devez comprendre afin d'obtenir le salut. Tout d'abord, personne ne va au paradis parce qu'il est une bonne personne. Nous n'allons pas au paradis grâce à nos bonnes œuvres. En effet, la Bible dit en Romains chapitre 3, verset 23, « Car tous ont péché » et sont privés de la gloire de Dieu. Aux yeux de Dieu, nous sommes tous coupables d'avoir enfreint sa loi. Nous avons tous commis le péché, comme vous, comme moi. Chaque fois que nous avons menti, même désobéi à nos parents, ou convoité les choses qui ne nous appartiennent pas, comme des possessions, des richesses, ou, ou une femme qui n'est pas la nôtre, toutes ces choses-là sont des péchés. Et la Bible dit, nous sommes tous des pécheurs. Voilà pourquoi nous sommes tous coupables aux yeux de Dieu. Et la Bible dit, il y a un châtiment pour le péché, car Dieu est juste. Il ne peut pas laisser le péché impuni. C'est pourquoi il dit en Romains chapitre 6, verset 23, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort. » Ainsi, voilà pourquoi nous mourrons, voilà pourquoi nous devons mourir. C'est à cause du péché. C'est une punition, car Dieu doit punir le péché. Et quand la Bible parle de la mort, elle ne parle pas seulement d'une mort physique, mais cela parle surtout d'une mort spirituelle, de la mort spirituelle qui est l'enfer. Car quand nous sommes morts, nous allons soit au ciel, au paradis, soit en enfer. Et les gens qui meurent dans leur péché, sans être pardonnés, vont en enfer. La Bible appelle cela la seconde mort. En Révélation 21, verset 8, la Bible dit « Mais les peureux et les incrédules et les abominables et les meurtriers et les prostituées et les sorciers, et les idolâtres, et tous les menteurs, 
auront leur part dans le lac qui brûle avec du feu et du soufre, ce qui est la seconde mort. La Bible ici nous donne une liste de pécheurs et nous dit « Tous ces gens-là auront leur part dans le lac qui brûle avec du feu et du soufre, ce qui est la seconde mort. » Il parle donc ici de l'enfer, de la mort spirituelle. Et nous, et nous voyons ici, dans cette liste, plusieurs péchés. Et Dieu veut nous faire comprendre que nous sommes tous dans cette liste et que nous, nous appartenons tous à cette seconde mort. Nous méritons tous cette seconde mort. Pourquoi Nous ne sommes peut-être pas tous des meurtriers, nous ne sommes peut-être pas tous des sorciers, mais nous avons tous menti, au moins une fois dans notre vie, il faut bien l'admettre. Et nombre d'entre nous ont fait pire que ça. Et si vous dites « Non, je ne suis pas dans cette liste », là, vous y êtes, vous avez menti, car nous appartenons tous à cette liste. C'est un endroit terrible et vous ne voulez pas y aller, car c'est pour toujours. L'enfer, ça dure pour toujours. Vous êtes mort et ensuite, c'est pour toujours. Ça ne s'arrête jamais. Mais Dieu est un Dieu d'amour, Dieu nous aime, il ne veut pas que nous allions dans cet endroit terrible, il veut nous sauver. C'est pourquoi il dit, en Romains chapitre 6, verset 23, comme nous avons déjà vu, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort, mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. » Alors la première partie du verset, c'est la condamnation, c'est une mauvaise nouvelle, car les gages du péché, c'est la mort, oui, mais Dieu ne nous laisse pas avec une mauvaise nouvelle, sans nous donner un échappatoire. La deuxième partie du verset dit « Mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. » Ainsi, si, si nous sommes condamnés, nous pouvons échapper gratuitement à la condamnation. Dieu veut nous offrir le don de la vie éternelle. C'est un cadeau que Dieu veut nous offrir. Et c'est par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. En Éphésiens chapitre 2, versets 8 et 9, la Bible dit « Car vous êtes sauvés par la grâce, par le moyen de la foi, et cela ne vient pas de vous, c'est le don de Dieu. Ce n'est point par les œuvres, afin que personne ne se glorifie. Encore, car vous êtes sauvés, sauvés de l'enfer, sauvés de vos péchés qui vous conduisaient en enfer. Vous êtes sauvés par la grâce. La grâce, c'est quelque chose que nous ne méritons pas, mais qui nous est donné quand même, qui nous est offert gratuitement. Exactement comme quand le président de la République donne sa grâce présidentielle à un condamné, il dit simplement « Je te gracie, donc tu n'es plus condamné, simplement parce que je le veux. » Eh bien, avec Dieu, c'est pareil. Il veut nous donner la vie éternelle par sa grâce, car nous ne le méritons pas, mais il veut nous la donner quand même. Car vous êtes sauvés par la grâce, par le moyen de la foi, donc c'est par rapport à ce que vous croyez dans votre cœur, c'est par rapport à vos croyances. Et cela ne vient pas de vous, c'est le don de Dieu. Donc, le salut, le fait d'accéder au paradis, au ciel, cela ne vient pas de nous, cela n'a rien à voir avec ce que nous avons fait, c'est le don de Dieu. Donc c'est un don pour lequel Dieu a payé, c'est Dieu qui a payé pour ça. Au verset 9, il dit « Ce n'est point par les œuvres, afin que personne ne se glorifie. » En fait, il le dit de quatre manières différentes. De quatre manières différentes, il dit « Être sauvé est un cadeau de Dieu, la vie éternelle est un cadeau de Dieu. » Ainsi, c'est Dieu qui a tout payé. Et c'est pourquoi nous n'avons rien à faire, nous n'avons aucune bonne œuvre à faire. Car les bonnes œuvres, c'est dur, c'est difficile, c'est du travail. Mais le salut ne s'obtient pas par les bonnes œuvres, c'est le don de Dieu. Et c'est pour ça que c'est une bonne nouvelle. Et cela a à voir bien sûr avec ce que Jésus a fait. Jésus est le Fils de Dieu. La Bible dit en Matthieu chapitre 1, verset 22, à propos de la naissance de Jésus, la Bible dit « Or, tout cela arriva, afin que s'accomplisse ce que le Seigneur avait dit en ces termes par le prophète, voici, une vierge sera enceinte et elle enfantera un fils et on le nommera Emmanuel, ce qui signifie « Dieu avec nous ». Car oui, son nom c'est Jésus-Christ, c'est le nom le plus exalté de tous les noms, mais on peut aussi le nommer Emmanuel, ce qui est simplement un nom hébreu qui signifie « Dieu avec nous ». Car Jésus, le Fils de Dieu, est Dieu manifesté dans la chair. La Bible dit « Dieu a été manifesté en la chair ». Il a vécu une vie parfaite. La Bible dit « Il a été tenté en tout point comme nous le sommes, cependant sans péché. » Jésus n'a jamais péché parce qu'il est Dieu, il est parfait. Il ne commet pas le péché, il n'y a aucun péché en lui. Et il prêchait le royaume de Dieu, il prêchait l'évangile, la, la parole de Dieu, la vérité. Et euh, il guérissait des gens, il faisait des miracles. Mais beaucoup l'ont détesté et ils ont fini par le livrer pour être tué et pour être crucifié sur la croix. Mais Jésus, pas, personne ne l'a forcé à aller sur la croix. 
Personne ne l'a forcé à mourir pour nous, il s'est donné de lui-même. La Bible dit en Romains chapitre 5 au verset 8, « Mais Dieu fait valoir son amour envers nous, en ce que, lorsque nous étions encore des pécheurs, Christ est mort pour nous. » Donc c'est par amour que Christ s'est donné sur la croix. C'est par amour que Christ est allé à la croix, volontairement a versé son sang pour nous. Bien que nous soyons des pécheurs, Christ est mort pour nous, faisant donc preuve de son amour pour nous. Il s'est offert volontairement, obéissant à son Père et accomplissant les Écritures de l'Ancien Testament. En Ésaïe 53, la Bible prévoyait cela. Au verset 5, la Bible dit à propos de Jésus sur la croix, « Mais il était meurtri pour nos péchés et frappé pour nos iniquités. Le châtiment qui nous apporte la paix est tombé sur lui, et par sa meurtrissure, nous avons la guérison. Nous étions tous errants comme des brebis, nous suivions chacun son propre chemin, et l'Éternel a fait venir sur lui l'iniquité de nous tous. L'Éternel a fait venir sur Jésus l'iniquité, c'est-à-dire le péché de nous tous. Quand il était sur la croix, en fait Jésus portait le péché du monde entier. En fait, il était puni à notre place. Nous méritions de mourir, et eh bien il est mort pour nous, il est mort à notre place sur la croix. Et il, a donc, il est donc mort sur cette croix, il a été enseveli, et trois jours plus tard, la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'il est ressuscité. Il n'est pas resté mort, car il est Dieu, il a le pouvoir de vaincre la mort, il a vaincu la mort. En acte 2, versets 31 et 32, la Bible dit, « Prévoyant cela, il dit de la résurrection du Christ, que son âme ne serait point laissée dans l'enfer, et que sa chair ne verrait point la corruption. » Dieu a ressuscité ce Jésus, nous en sommes tous témoins. Donc ils étaient témoins, les apôtres étaient témoins de la résurrection de Jésus. Et aujourd'hui, vous entendez cette histoire, Jésus est ressuscité, il est vivant. Et il est assis à la droite de son Père dans le ciel. Ainsi, puisque Jésus a payé pour nos péchés et qu'il est ressuscité, il a donc le pouvoir de vaincre la mort. C'est comme ça qu'il a payé pour le don de la vie éternelle. Comment faire pour obtenir cette vie éternelle Eh bien, comme tout cadeau, vous avez le choix. Vous pouvez soit l'accepter ou le refuser. La Bible dit en Romains 6, 23, « Car les gages du péché, c'est la mort, mais le don de Dieu, c'est la vie éternelle par Jésus-Christ notre Seigneur. » Vous pouvez donc choisir d'accepter ce cadeau par la foi. Car vous ne voyez pas Jésus aujourd'hui, vous ne voyez pas, vous ne l'avez pas vu ressusciter, et vous entendez cet évangile, et vous pouvez décider d'y croire si vous voulez. Et vous acceptez ce cadeau par la foi. La Bible dit en Jean 3, 16, « Car Dieu a tellement aimé le monde, qu'il a donné son seul Fils engendré, afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse point, mais qu'il ait la vie éternelle. » Ici, il est mentionné « quiconque croit en lui ». Il n'est aucunement mentionné le fait d'aller à l'église, ou d'être baptisé, ou de faire des bonnes œuvres. Bien sûr, ces choses-là sont bonnes, mais en ce qui concerne le salut et la vie éternelle, il est seulement mentionné « quiconque croit en lui », c'est-à-dire quiconque a la foi en Jésus, quiconque croit que Jésus est mort sur la croix, qu'il a été enseveli et qu'il est ressuscité pour payer pour, le, pour nos péchés. Si vous croyez cela, la Bible dit, vous avez la vie éternelle. Alors voilà comment vous recevez le cadeau de Dieu, voilà comment vous recevez la vie éternelle. La Bible dit en Romains chapitre 10, verset 9, que si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus et que tu crois dans ton cœur que Dieu l'a ressuscité des morts, tu seras sauvé. Si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus, c'est-à-dire si tu admets être un pécheur, en danger de l'enfer, condamné à l'enfer, et, et que tu confesses que Jésus a effectivement payé pour tes péchés sur la croix et qu'il est ressuscité. Bien sûr, il faut aussi que tu, que tu y crois de ton cœur, il faut que ça vienne du cœur. La Bible dit, si tu confesses de ta bouche le Seigneur Jésus et que tu crois dans ton cœur que Dieu l'a ressuscité des morts, tu seras sauvé. C'est une promesse. Il ne dit pas, peut-être, avec un peu de chance, tu seras sauvé. Ou... Non, il dit, tu seras sauvé. C'est une promesse de Dieu. C'est pourquoi il dit, au verset 13, « Car quiconque invoquera le nom du Seigneur sera sauvé. » Si donc vous lui demandez, il promet de vous sauver et de vous donner la vie éternelle. Et de la même façon que vous n'avez rien fait pour mériter cette vie éternelle, il n'y a rien que vous puissiez faire pour perdre ce cadeau une fois que vous l'avez reçu. Quelqu'un qui croit en Jésus, même s'il commet du péché plus tard, et il en commettra sûrement car nous péchons tous les jours, Dieu a donné ce cadeau. Et on avait l'habitude de dire, quand on était enfant, on disait « Donner, c'est donner, reprendre, c'est voler. » Et puisque Dieu vous a donné la vie éternelle, si vous lui avez demandé, il ne peut pas vous la reprendre, car Dieu est juste. Une fois qu'il vous a fait un cadeau, c'est pour toujours. 
Pour vous assurer de ceci, je vais vous lire ce que dit Jésus en Jean chapitre 10, versets 27 à 30. « Mes brebis entendent ma voix, et je les connais, et elles me suivent. » Les brebis, ce sont les croyants, ce sont les gens qui ont invoqué le nom du Seigneur, comme dit, comme dit la Bible, ce sont les gens qui croient en Jésus-Christ. « Mes brebis entendent ma voix, et je les connais, et elles me suivent. Et je leur donne la vie éternelle, et elles ne périront jamais, et nul ne les ravira de ma main. Mon Père, qui me les a donnés, est plus grand que tous, et personne ne peut les ravir de la main de mon Père. Moi et mon Père, nous sommes un. » Donc, quand vous, quand vous croyez en Jésus-Christ, quand vous êtes un croyant, quand vous avez cru à l'Évangile, la Bible dit « Jésus vous tient dans sa main, et personne ne peut vous en arracher. » Parce que ça ne dépend pas de vous, mais c'est lui qui vous tient. Et de la même façon, vous êtes dans la main de son Père. Et il n'y a personne qui est plus fort que Dieu le Père. Donc il vous tient. Et il n'y a, a rien que vous puissiez faire pour, pour sortir de là. Personne ne peut vous en arracher, car ça dépend de lui. Et c'est lui, avec son pouvoir, qui vous retient. Voilà pourquoi, quand vous êtes sauvé, vous êtes toujours sauvé. Et vous pouvez avoir la paix. D'ailleurs, Dieu dit, je, je ne me souviendrai plus de leurs péchés, ni de leurs iniquités. Voilà pourquoi vous êtes sauvé pour toujours. Et vous avez la paix avec Jésus. Tous vos péchés sont pardonnés et oubliés. Ainsi, si vous avez cru ces choses, j'aimerais vous inviter à formuler une prière. Je peux vous aider à formuler une prière. Si vous croyez que Jésus est mort pour vous sur la croix et qu'il est ressuscité, pourquoi ne pas prier avec moi dès maintenant Voilà ce que vous pouvez dire à Jésus. « Cher Jésus, je reconnais être un pécheur et mériter d'aller en enfer. Mais je crois que tu es mort pour moi sur la croix et que tu es ressuscité. » Je te prie, s'il te plaît, de me pardonner et de me donner la vie éternelle. Gloire à toi. Merci. Amen. Voilà. Si vous avez prié cette prière et que vous y croyez dans votre cœur, vous êtes sauvé. Félicitations et gloire à Dieu.